In this episode, let's continue our look at ZFS on Linux. In part one, we covered the basic ins and outs of ZFS. So in this episode, let's focus on some of the more advanced file system features offered by ZFS. If you haven't already watched ZFS on Linux part one, episode 35, I highly suggest you do that now as it plays well into this episode. Before we dive into compression, snapshots, quotas, and data deduplication using ZFS, I thought it would be a good idea to cover some best practices just in case the episode inspires you to try ZFS for yourself. The first suggestion is that if you're going to be using ZFS in production, it's highly recommended that you use ECC memory. ZFS is great at repairing failures and data corruption via checksums, but if a bad memory module is silently introducing corruption via RAM and the bad data gets saved to disk, you're likely in for a bad situation. If you want to read more about this, you can check out the free NAS forums for a nice little discussion. There's also this nice little Google Groups thread. And finally, the ZFS administration guide on why you should use ECC memory. This is a pretty large topic and it's not limited to ZFS, so if you're interested in reading more about it, these links can be found in the episode notes below. Let me just refresh your memory about our test setup. You might remember that back in episode 35, I talked about how I created a virtual environment with 10 disks those being dev sdb through sdk, each roughly 100 megabytes in size. We then used these virtual devices to play around with ZFS pools. You should also remember that you can look at the existing ZFS pools by running zpool status. I just wanted to show you how to grow ZFS pools because I think it plays well into the second recommended best practice. So here we have our E37 pool, and it's made up of several disk mirrors. The E37 pool is also mounted, and it's about 225 megs in size. Now let's say that you've reached the capacity of this pool and you wanted to add some additional space. How would you go about that? Well, since ZFS is a combined volume manager and file system, it's actually pretty easy to add additional capacity to the ZFS file system. It just so happens that we have four spare virtual disks on our system. So let's work through adding these to the pool. Let's type zpool add E37 pool mirror SDH, SDI, mirror, SDJ, and SDK. This will create two additional mirrors, one of SDH and SDI, and a second mirror of SDJ and SDK. Then we're going to add these to the E37 pool. We can verify this work by running zpool status again. And as you can see, we have our two new mirrors down here, but we can also verify that the file system was resized by running df again. So before we had 225 megs of space, and now we have 396 megabytes. Personally, I think this is pretty cool and a major advancement over existing file systems in that if you wanted to do something similar with LVM, you would have to run all of these commands to add devices to the RAID, grow the volume group, and finally grow the file system. You might even have to take the volume offline for some of these steps. With ZFS, it's one command, and it's all done online. I should also mention that you can only expand the pool, you cannot shrink it. Okay, so now that we've refreshed our memories about ZFS pools and what they look like, let's chat about the second recommended best practice. This has to do with how I created the pool in episode 35 using the Linux device names, devices like dev sdb, sdc, and sdd. Let's just start fresh by running zpool status again. I'm talking about these devices down here. If this were a real production system, you'd likely not want to use device names because it creates a management nightmare if you have lots of devices. There is a great little blurb about this on the ZFS on Linux FAQ page. You actually have several choices on how you'd like to reference devices in a pool. For example, in episode 35, we used Linux device names, but you can also use drive identification numbers, things like serial numbers, etc or you can choose to use physical layout information, things like PCI slot number and port number. Finally, you can also create your own label types. These might describe a physical location, for example. So why would you want to do something like this? Well, it basically boils down to ease of management when things go wrong. Say, for example, that you think ZFS is pretty great, so you purchase some hardware and it supports lots of disks. Let's say a 48-bay chassis. You have it all up and running using ECC memory and things are going great until you have a disk failure. If you use device names provided by Linux, like I did in these examples, it's likely going to be a nightmare trying to find the failed disk, as it's not clear how these device names map to physical locations. And once you've figured out the mapping, then you'll likely want to swap the failed disk and rebuild the ZFS storage pool online. 
The issue is that there's an extremely high chance that when you reboot the machine down the road, your drive letters will have shifted, since when that disk failed and you replaced it with a new one, you were likely given a new device name. So if you created the pool using device names, it's now likely out of whack, since before and after the reboot, the devices have likely shifted around. This was due to the removal of the dead disk from the system. This is fixable just by asking ZFS to re-import the array by rereading the headers off the disk, but this requires manual intervention. So I would suggest creating the ZFS pool with something like drive identification numbers. Then no matter what device drive letter, your pool should always come back online without manual intervention. A handy trick would be to create your pool using disk by ID. Then you can add physical labels to each disk carrier, which indicates the unique information about that disk, like a serial number. So when a failure happens, it's easy to match the zpool status field disk information with the physical label on each disk. If you happen to create ZFS pools using explicit dev sdb drive letters, don't worry, you can convert to using disk by id after the fact. Let's export our ZFS pool using dev sd device names and then import it using disk by id names. So after this is done, even if we swap the underlying device names around, our pool will always come back online. You can export the array which unmounts it and effectively removes it from the system by running zpool export, then the pool name, in our case e37 pool. Let's verify that it's actually gone by running zpool status, and as you can see there's no pools available. And let's just verify that it's unmounted by running df. So one cool thing about ZFS, and this is actually possible with other RAID devices too, is that if you were actually to move these disks to a different system, it would work because all the data about the array is actually stored on the disks. Now let's import our ZFS pool again, but this time using the new disk by ID names, so that we can survive devices like dev sdb from being renamed out from under us. So we're going to import the ZFS pool by reading the metadata off each disk. So let's type zpool import minus d, this specifies the device we want to use, dev disk by ID, then the pool name, in our case, E37 pool, and finally dash F to force it. Then let's verify it worked by running zpool status. As you can see, we're using the unique drive identification numbers to reference the device, rather than the block device name like dev sdb for example. We can also verify this is mounted correctly by running df. I should also mention that when we ran zpool import, it scans the devices for ZFS metadata and constructs our pool. And this could take a while if you had lots of disks. Okay, so that covers the several best practices that I wanted to talk about, along with how to grow your ZFS pool. Let's move on to the more advanced file system features offered by ZFS on Linux. Things like compression, deduplication, snapshots, and quotas. Up until this point, we've mainly only talked about the zpool command for working with ZFS on Linux. But there's actually a second command called just ZFS. The ZFS command allows you to turn on and off various features, along with getting and setting properties. The following is probably best described through diagrams. Let's say for example you're working at a research lab and your ZFS pool has 100 terabytes of storage. This is a lot of storage to play around with, so you'll likely have many projects and people working with this storage pool. So you'll likely want to shape the way they do things. You see with ZFS you create a storage volume and is presented as one large chunk of storage, as shown by this box diagram. You will sometimes hear people using the terms pool of storage or tank of storage. These are the most common, but they all refer to the same thing. Let's say we have four projects, A, B, C, and D. All of these projects can use the same pool or tank of storage, but these projects all have different requirements. Let's say project A is a group of scientists working on gene sequencing data. Typically, these are large text files coming off a sequencer. So you might want to add a policy to Project A's area for data deduplication, since a scientist typically takes one of these raw files, makes a copy, and starts doing their work. Also, since these are mainly text files, we should add compression to their area, since we can likely save a lot of space. Finally, since we know Project A has large storage requirements, we probably want to enforce some type of quota, just to make sure they do not use space assigned to projects B, C, or D. It just so happens that ZFS allows us to create areas called datasets. These look like directories on the end system, but you can assign all types of advanced features to each dataset. We will use these datasets to carve up the large pool or tank of storage. 
Next, let's say Project B is mainly user data and home directories, and you've had many requests in the past to restore files from backup since things occasionally get deleted. So you think it might be a good idea to add hourly snapshots during office hours, so that files can quickly be restored from a snapshot folder rather than tape backup. Actually, I should probably remove this hard line and add a dotted line. Same goes for Project C and D. Reason being is that Project A is the only one with a quota, meaning that Project A cannot consume more than a set limit of storage where projects B, C, and D are basically sharing the rest of the storage pool. I went ahead and created datasets for projects C and D, even though we do not have any special requirements yet. This just adds the ability down the road, say for example that we want to create snapshots or something. Anyways, now that we have a high level of what we want, let's go ahead and set this up. I think you'll be blown away at how easy this is. So let's just get our bearings by running df again, and zpool list. First off, let's create our four project datasets by running zfs create e37 pool slash project a, project b, project c, and finally project d. You'll notice a convention happening here. The e37 pool is our large chunk of storage, then these projects a, b, c, and d are our datasets used to divide up the storage. Let's run df-h again, and you will notice that we have our four new mounts, one for each of our project datasets. First, let's configure compression. I thought it would be cool to show you examples of all these features, so I downloaded a log file and we'll use it as a test. Right now, I'm sitting in Root's home directory. Let's just list the files here. As you can see, there's a NASA web server log. I used this in a previous episode, number 28 would be an example, and this file is about 161 megabytes in size. Let me just show you the ZFS mounts again. As you can see, there's zero space used. So let's turn on compression for project A by running ZFS set compression equals LZ4. LZ4 is the compression algorithm. Then the pool and data set we want to use. In our case, E37 pool slash project A. And that's it. Files going into and coming out of the project A data set will be compressed and decompressed on the fly. This is totally transparent to the end user. Let's go ahead and test this out by copying our 161 megabyte web server log file into project A's area. Let's run df again. And you will notice that it says only 32 megabytes are used. We can also verify this by running zfs list. So it looks like compression is working, but you can get the exact compression ratio by running zfs get compress ratio e37 pool slash project A. And as you can see, we're getting a great compression ratio of 5.12. Pretty cool. If you'd like to learn more about this, check out the ZFS administration guide on compression and data deduplication. Actually, speaking of data deduplication, let's chat about that. I was not actually able to get data deduplication working on CentOS 6.5 using ZFS 0.63. And I'll be honest, I've never actually used data deduplication in production before. I did play around with it for a couple hours and nothing seemed to work. I'll likely try a dev version and see if that fixes anything. Anyways, it probably doesn't really matter as deduplication is not recommended unless you really know what you're doing, as talked about in the things nobody told you about ZFS page. There is also an article that mentions for every terabyte of space you want to dedupe, it takes roughly 3.5 to 5 gigabytes of RAM to maintain the dedupe table. So in our example of 100 terabytes of storage, it would actually take roughly 350 to 500 gigabytes of RAM just for the data deduplication table, which seems pretty crazy. You'll likely want to heavily research this before enabling it. I've added these three links to the episode notes below. To finish off the requirements for Project A's data set, let's set up quotas by running ZFS set quota equals 150 megs E37 pool Project A. But we can also configure a storage reservation by running zfs set reservation equals 150 megs e37 pool project a. And by running df again, you can see that we've limited the amount of space available to project a's dataset. But we've also reserved the space so that someone else in the pool, project b, c, or d, cannot use it. Let's just jump back to the diagram for a minute. You can think of the quota and reservation as hard walls that we set up around Project A's dataset from the rest of the pool. Actually, now that we have this diagram up, let's play around with snapshots for Project B's dataset. Snapshots allow you to capture the file system state, similar to how other file systems do this, but ZFS allows you to explore these online. Let's change into the E37 pool Project B directory and create some files. Let's say that we're working on an important paper called paper zfs 101 
and we'll add some example text in here. And maybe we'll go ahead and create some example directories. Finally, now that we have our examples configured, let's go ahead and take a snapshot by running ZFS snapshot E37 pool project B at. The sat sign denotes the pool and data set we want to capture. Then everything to the right of the at sign is the snapshot name. So let's pass in a dynamic date so that each run will get a different name. So now that we've grabbed a snapshot, let's list the snapshots by running ZFS list t for type and snapshot. And as you can see, we have our snapshot here. What's great about these snapshots is that they only contain the changes between when the snapshot was taken and the current state, so they can be extremely small if no files were changed. So let's clear the page so we can start fresh. Okay, so at this point we have the snapshot of the Project B dataset. So let's delete our important file called paper ZFS 101. Uh oh, so how do we get this file back? Well, ZFS snapshots are really cool, and you can actually get access to the live snapshot. And you can do that by going into this hidden directory called .zfs, and you'll notice that it's not listed here. In this .zfs directory, you can see the listing of all the snapshots for this data set. Let's just list the snapshots again by running ZFS list -t snapshot, and you'll notice that these two values match. You could even have thousands of snapshots, and they would all show in this hidden .zfs directory. Let's just clear the screen again because it's getting a little busy with all this text. So as you can see here, we're in our snapshot folder and our deleted file is in here. We can use the snapshot to restore the files by simply copying them from the live snapshot over to our project B directory. Let's just go back to the project B directory and verify it worked. This is pretty cool. Personally, I just love snapshots because they're so easy to work with and they can take so little space if you're not changing a lot of files. Snapshots are especially great for things like home directories. Say for example that you configure a cron job to take a ZFS snapshot Monday to Friday 9 to 5. This will allow you to go back through the week and retrieve files if someone mistakenly deletes something. This isn't a replacement for backups, but it does give you some extra flexibility. You can also do all sorts of cool things with snapshots, like mounting them as a clone of a file system. You can also restore them back to a point in time, say for example that you botched an upgrade. Alright, I've definitely talked for way too long, so hopefully at this point you have a pretty good idea of what ZFS on Linux is, and some of the advanced features that it offers. You'll also notice that throughout these demos we did everything online, and that you don't have to unmount the datasets, or any funny business, it just works. Alright, that concludes this episode. Thanks for watching. If you would like to get notified about future episodes, please subscribe to my mailing list. You can do this by going to the Get Notified link in the header and entering your email address. Have questions, comments, or concerns about this episode? What about episode ideas? I'd love to hear your feedback, either good or bad. Shoot me an email, justin at sysadmincasts.com.